Welcome to the fireside uh, chat of the Zero Project Conference on the European Accessibility Act. Um, we're going to have some 30 minutes uh, of our time in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, Zero Project Conference uh, session, which where we're having two uh, great guests to talk to. One is uh, Immaculada Brasencia Borrero from the uh, European Union, from the European Commission, who is, uh, I, I don't think she likes the term, but she's somehow uh, the, the, not maybe the mother, but the god, the godmother of the European Accessibility Act. To uh, welcome here, Immaculada, for joining us, uh, and Thank our you. and our uh, in-person guest here is is um, uh, is a, a good and dear old friend uh, from uh, former times. He worked for the W3C, so he's really an expert on on web accessibility. So it's um, it's it's. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I have to concentrate. We had some technical issues before. Um, so we have uh, Abu Sara, Shadi Abu, Abu Sara. So I've, I'm, I tended to mix this up. So sorry about that. So welcome, Shari. Uh, so we're going to have a Shadi. We're having to have an engaged discussion on the on the European Accessibility Act. We will start with uh, Immaculada giving us the background, the development, where we are in the progress of implementing the European Accessibility Act uh, in, in the European Union. And uh, then we have an, we'll follow up with uh, Shadi giving, up, giving us the, the Amazon.com uh, perspective. So Shadi, to complete his introduction in the, in the right way, is working for, uh, for Amazon.com. He will give us a, a, a closer description of, of, his, of his job there in, in a few seconds. So Shadi will give us the, uh, the Amazon.com perspective on how the Amazon.com is seeing uh, the process and how this works together. And then we hopefully have uh, some uh, joint discussion uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the third uh, part of this uh, session. And we will close the session with Petra, our graphic facilitator, who will uh, wrap up and summarize everything uh, in pictures. So let's start this. Um, um, Immaculada, could you start us with giving us the background? The, uh, the European Accessibility Act uh, is in place since 2019. Uh, what was where we are right now? What happened since 2019? Okay. So thanks very much for, um, for the question and the opportunity of sharing with you uh, the work that we are doing on the European Accessibility Act. Um, as this event is broadcasted all around the world, let me just dedicate a couple of words to what is the Accessibility Act because we are so um, uh, embedded in its work that um, um, we need to realize that there's uh, many people around the world that might not know what it is, uh, the Accessibility Act. So um, the European Accessibility Act is a piece of uh, legislation, it's a legislative act that uh, requires two main things. One, that uh, uh, products and uh, services, certain products and certain services uh, are placed in the European market uh, when they are accessible, only accessible products from uh, a certain date, that is June 2025, will uh, be um, uh, set in the market when they are accessible. The second thing that the Act uh, does is um, to uh, link the accessibility requirements that we have for those uh, list of products and services, which are mainly, uh, they have a very strong ICT component, um, we're talking about computers, telephones, we're talking about TVs, we're talking about um, e-books, e-readers, but we're talking also about services, information services related to, to um, uh, transport, we're talking about the banking and electronic communications, audiovisual media, so that gives you an idea. So what we are doing is in this second uh, uh, perspective is to take the requirements, the accessibility requirements that we place uh, or that we demand for um, those products and services, and we use them also in the context of public procurement, making them compulsory for those products and services, but using those requirements for uh, other products and services, for example, in relation to the user interface or to the provision of information on services, to get reassurance uh, for uh, manufacturers and service providers and procurers that um, they are fulfilling the obligation of buying accessible um, or delivering um, accessible. So those two things. 
So that is what the Act uh, basically does. Uh, the Act was adopted, uh, formally adopted by uh, the three legislators uh, in the European Union uh, by um, 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 2019. And since then, what we have been doing is working together first with the member states uh, in order to take that European legislation and transpose it, as we say, or make it national law. This, this type of European legislation need to be translated into national legislation. Um, member states have got until uh, 28th of June this year to do the exercise. So from 28th June, um, they would need to have national legislation that transposes the, the Accessibility Act. And then we will start with the next step in the process, which is working also with uh, uh, economic operators, uh, procurers, uh, to uh, the implementation, to support the implementation of the Act. Uh, that needs uh, to be ready because the Act will apply from uh, 28th of June 2025. From that date, these products that I mentioned will only be placed in the European market when they comply with the accessibility of requirements of the Act. So what we are doing to support um, this implementation process is uh, diverse. On one hand, we are preparing some standardization measures, standardization uh, requests uh, to the European standardization organization so that they develop European harmonized standards that contain more technical detail uh, on how to implement the functional accessibility requirements of the directive. We are also uh, working and will be working on a new initiative that was announced in our um, in our very recently adopted strategy for the rights of persons with disabilities is the creation of a resource center, a European resource center to support the implementation of accessibility. So I think this is uh, provides you an overview of um, where we are at this moment in the work related to the Accessibility Act. Thank you. Um, thank you, Makalada. I would like to drill down a little before uh, bringing in uh, Shadi in this discussion. Um, there are, I think, some key terms and that, um, th that the audience needs to understand to fully see how this is going to work. So I think one of the key elements is the, the procurement. So there are processes there that the proc public procurement system uh, yeah, only uh, allows uh, accessible products and services to be bought. And so this is one cornerstone. So maybe you, uh, you elaborate a little on this process. And the other one is what is accessibility? How is that defined? Okay. So um, um, before, before the European Accessibility Act was adopted, we have um, other legislation in Europe that regulates public procurement. These are also um, several directives. Those directives already require to buy accessible. The way in which it's formulated is that in the tender uh, specification, so in the call for tenders, um, accessibility must be taken on board. Uh, but uh, it also allows to um, use accessibility um, as a criteria in the award of the tenders. So the tender procedure is first you describe um, what you want to buy and the characteristics of what you want to buy. And I'm doing it very unorthodox in this des the, uh, description. And um, one of those um, features, characteristics of what you want to buy is accessibility. Then among those bids that uh, fulfill uh, those requirements, you can you have to select which one you take. And there you may say, I'm going to give extra points to those that are most accessible. So this is the European accessibility um, public procurement legislation. Now, that legislation does not say what accessibility is. It just say, you know, basically by accessible. And here is where there is a link with the European Accessibility Act that contains an annex with accessibility requirements for the products and services in the Act. And what the Act says is basically uh, for those products and services in procurement, you must use these requirements. 
you must, it is compulsory. Now, uh, it goes further and says for other products and services, um, you can use those requirements for the elements or functions covered in the Accessibility Act. Um, and then you get presumption of compliance with the accessibility obligation, but only for the elements that are covered on the Act. I will provide you an example. The Accessibility Act focuses, for example, in the area of transport, on the provision of information, on the websites, on the uh, self-service terminals that are used to checking or um, ticketing machines. Uh, but it does not cover um, vehicles. Why is that? Because there are other pieces of EU legislation that covers vehicles or there are even international provisions. So when you are going to buy, let's say, a transport service for the part that is covered uh, in the by the Accessibility Act, there um, you can use the requirements of uh, in Annex 1 of uh, the directive. But this does not take away that you need to complete that with other elements, like in the case that I mentioned, you can use the Accessibility Act for the website, for the provision of information, for the, uh, for the ticketing machines, yet you will have to specify separately or uh, I mean in the same document, but with other requirements, how that vehicles will have to be accessible. I hope that this, um, that this example uh, clarifies how um, the Accessibility Act interacts with uh, public procurement. Um, thanks a lot, Ima. Um, so now over to you, uh, Shadi. Uh, so let's start with giving uh, the audience a brief background on yourself and your new role uh, within Amazon.com. Okay, the button wasn't fully pressed. <laughs> thank you, Michael. So yes, uh, uh, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, my name is Shadi Abuzara. I uh, joined uh, Amazon uh, fairly recently in October, um, but I've been working in the field of digital accessibility for over two decades now, um, and the last uh, 18 plus years uh, for the World Wide Web Consortium um, on uh, web accessibility uh, more specifically. Um, at Amazon, I work on, uh, well, how could it be different on accessibility standards uh, and policies? Uh, so um, I'm really focusing here quite a lot on um, how to um, uh, integrate um, uh, accessibility, the, the, the way that Amazon approaches accessibility more generally um, with uh, the existing standards and standards that are yet to be developed uh, that are urgently needed as technology evolves. Um, yeah. um, Shadi, uh, before we go into this, uh, uh, discussion that's directly related to the uh, European Accessibility Act. I think what's needed as a background is how does Amazon.com in general approach accessibility? What's the policy behind this? What rules? I think arguably the, you're the biggest addressee of, uh, of the European Accessibility Act with this broad range of services, thinking of Amazon Prime Video and, and products and uh, I think there's more to come uh, as far as I understand Amazon. So how, what is the general policy of Amazon? Be uh, .com when it comes to accessibility? Yeah, gr great question. So um, Amazon really works by um, uh, principles, uh, principles that are uh, provided that are followed in all decision making. Um, I, uh, it was for me really interesting to see when I came on board that really at, at, at meetings, decisions are taken uh, based on these principles. And uh, one of the leading principles is customer obsession. Uh, what does that really mean? It means focusing on the user and working backwards from there. Uh, it's really driven by the user experience. And that, I think, is such a close fit with accessibility. Uh, for years and years in accessibility, we've been saying we need to follow a user-centered approach to accessibility. It's, it's not about checking, uh, ticking check boxes. Uh, you know, um, it, it's not about pleasing the standard, so to say. Uh, it, it's about pleasing the user. And so I think this mindset is really essential, really uh, central to accessibility and how it uh, enables us to, 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 to um, apply accessibility across the whole range of products and services. I think 
uh, you know, we're talking here about TVs. Uh, we, 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 uh, Amazon just announced um, um, selling 150 million TV devices. Uh, these are all with rich suite of, of, of accessibility features, uh, like the built-in voice view, uh, screen reader, uh, enlargeable text, um, and, and, and many more. So this is just one example. Um, the Echo devices, uh, robots, uh <laughs> all sorts of products and services uh, that, that are available. And, and so, um, you know, trying to address accessibility on such a large scale um, is not a matter of, you know, following, um, you know, a, a, a set procedure as such. You know, th there's a certain amount of experimentation that needs to happen. There's a certain amount of uh, autonomy that the different uh, groups need to have depending on the products and services that they're providing. Um, just a, a second, maybe quite brief, brief question, or the question is longer, but maybe the answer. Uh, but um, is Amazon.com having a kind of global policy with maybe minimum requirements and then each country um, Im implements them and, and uh, applies local regulations or how is how's the general policy of Amazon on, on, on accessibility? Well, generally just given the scope um, uh, and the scale of, of, of the work, it's not really feasible to look at, uh, qu quite frankly, country by country. And, and, and um, you know, th the ultimate goal is to develop products that are universally, provide, a, 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 you know, an excellent customer experience, a, a delightful customer experience, uh, right? Um, and, and, and so we're looking at trying to achieve the highest standard rather than what's the minimum in each place uh, to achieve I, I, it's it's a tall order it's 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 um, but this is you know what we're driving towards this is what we want to achieve in terms of providing um, accessibility to the highest standard which is another principle of amazon mm -hmm. <laughs> okay then let's move closer to the ea again so what's uh, amazon uh, relationship what what is amazon specifically doing towards the eaa yeah, so a a as we heard, the, the EAA is being rolled out uh, r right now. As, as uh, we, we were hearing from, from, from Ima, I I is that the um, member states right now are uh, implementing the EU directive into their national law. That's a very important step that we're looking here. One of, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we're cl looking at very closely is um, will countries, uh, sometimes it does happen that the in, in, in transposing directives there are maybe sometimes changes uh, between one country and the other. So this is something that could create uh, some sort of fragmentation, uh, which uh, hopefully will not happen um, because that's the aim of the directive is to have more harmonization in Europe. And then there's a very important phase right now that we're entering, which um, uh, Ima also mentioned, the standardization phase. So uh, as a standards person uh, with my standards <laughs> background, I'm uh, you know, going to be participating. I'm already participating in the development of, uh, at, at W3C uh, of the web content accessibility guidelines. These standards continually evolving. Uh, but there are many more standards that we're expecting here uh, for the European Accessibility Act to really uh, elaborate on the, the requirements uh, that are in the, uh, in the uh, directive that Emo is talking about. So there are these functional requirements in the annex of uh, the EAA, but these will be detailed out with very specific uh, uh, technical standards that are yet to be developed, uh, some of them. So. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this next upcoming phase where we really uh, get into uh, the nitty-gritty of this uh, technical uh, requirements and standards development. So it seems to be these standards, or to be developed standards, are some of the key uh, of getting real change on the ground. So uh, maybe Mirkulada give us maybe a, a as good as is possible at this time, a description of what kind of standards or new standards are we looking at, what are the features so that they really do this what we need them to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the European legal system uh, allows um, the use of standards to provide presumption of conformity, meaning um, economic operators have to comply with the law, but the law says 
we will develop standards that if you comply technically with those standards, then we will presume that you are fulfilling the obligations in the law. Okay, there is a whole legal process behind it, initiated at uh, the European Commission. We have to uh, issue what we call an standardization mandate or an standardization request to the European to the European standardization organizations to develop those standards. Of course, we will not start from scratch because we have invested uh, the last uh, years um, into the uh, development of standards that would support our policies because we did not have yet really, well, we had the web directive at a certain moment, the web accessibility directive, but we did not have um, uh, the Accessibility Act yet uh, working. Nevertheless, we started long time ago developing standards and we have um, a standard that uh, resulted from um, a mandate many years ago of the European Commission. This is a standard in the area of ICT accessibility. We have another standard that is um, in the area of the built environment and another standard that uh, is in the area of design for all that says basically what an organization needs to do following the principles of design for all or universal design in order to ensure that the outcome, whether it is a product or a service that they are delivering, would be accessible. So what is in the pipeline now? In the pipeline now is uh, the update, the revision of those three standards to make sure that their quality, their level of accessibility, their content is sufficient to provide these presumption of conformity with EU law so that they address, for example, all the requirements in our um, Annex 1 that contains the, the accessibility um, uh, requirements, that they are of high quality. And uh, so that's one strand of the, our standardization work. The second strand uh, complementing this revision of those three standards is the development of new standards. One of them will deal with um, non-digital information, how to uh, provide accessible non-digital information that the directive requires. The other one relates to emergency communication. The directive requires that um, um, persons with disabilities would be able to use in accessible, um, in accessible ways uh, the European emergency uh, number 112 and that uh, it puts obligations on the economic operators, so uh, for example, telecom operators, to make it possible that you make a phone call. It puts obligations on the telephone, the telephone manufacturer, so that really the telephone is accessible and you can really call 112. But it also puts obligations on the public authorities, those that have what we call the PISA, the, 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 who, those who pick up the phone when you call 112, uh, so that they answer in an accessible way and using the same modes of communication that you used for calling in. So if you use text, they would respond in text. If you use video, they would respond in video. Mixing uh, the three of them, you could have a total conversation. Um, and there um, we also need a standard. So um, these are the what is in the pipeline in relation to uh, a standardization. What is changing from uh, previous um, work is that now we have a reference to which is those standards need to comply to. They need to deliver up to the levels of the um, directive. Uh, we had the same, uh, by the way, uh, process with the Web Accessibility Directive. Now, as the European Accessibility Act um, uh, addresses uh, areas in the digital domain covered by electronic communications, but also the web, what we have, uh, what we are doing with this uh, standardization mandate uh, is uh, to make sure that for the purpose of harmonization, the standard that would come out um, uh, would be also usable for the other uh, pieces of legislation, the web accessibility directive, um, uh, the electronic communications, but also public procurement, that uh, you could refer to those standards in, 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 uh, in public procurement. So it's an exciting process because um, we will develop um, a corpus of standards that would really 
provide a baseline for uh, further um, describing in te more technical details the requirements um, of accessibility in, uh, in Europe. Thank you so much, Ima. I think, I think you clarified a lot of details and I think we get a common understanding how this, uh, this will work in the future. I just got one very brief clarifying question before I hand over to you, Shadi. What is a non-digital information? Is this uh, the new word for a book or a phone call or what is that? Well, it's information that you provide, for example, accompanying a service, how a service works. It's information on how uh, a product uh, needs to be installed. Uh, it's information about the uh, two things, the functioning of a product or a service in accessible formats, and it is information um, about um, the accessibility characteristics of those. It is not um, a book, it is not um, uh, because um, we are not legislating on books. The Accessibility Act contains obligations for electronic books, but those are defined, uh, they have a definition of what type of, let's say, documents or electronic files would be considered as an um, electronic book. And uh, in this European legislation, the provision of an electronic book is a service, so they have some obligations. But this non-digital information is, okay, you get some information, for example, in paper, how do you make it accessible? This is um, mm -hmm. uh, part of the work. It's also about your customer services. The directive, uh, for example, says that when, um, uh, there might, it does not oblige to have customer services, but uh, when um, their, um, their service providers have got um, some um, customer services, then there are some um, requirements um, there to um, make them um, accessible or to interact with them. In, uh, in an accessible um, modes of communication, for example. So um, all this um, is what we mean by the non-digital, um, uh, non not necessarily digital information, eh? because the digital information will also have to be accessible, but it is to complement, so that to avoid that they say, okay, but this information we provide in paper, so we don't need to make it accessible. No, we will have standards that says how uh, that non-digital information would be considered to be um, accessible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So over to you, Shadi. I think standardization is very important for a global company the, uh, because you can get lost in, in, in different kind of standardizations. So uh, what's, what's, what's your approach on that? And uh, the last round would be if you want to comment on each other's remarks. Uh, this would conclude the session and then we hand over to the, uh, to the, to the graphic facilitation. So Shadi, what's your... Well, approach on, on standards. Maybe it is a bit of a, a, a comment on, on, on the standardization aspect here and, and um, uh, you know, j just looking at this from, from a global uh, business perspective in terms of one of the, the, the things of uh, the harmonization work that has happened in developing the European standard. Um, and I, I think uh, even at uh, one of the previous uh, Zero Project conferences, this was awarded. Uh, uh, well, the, the European Commission and the U.S. Access Board uh, for the work here on on um, ha harmonizing the requirements uh, to, to a global business. This is really important. Um, we are seeing uh, the European standard. It's called EN301549. Uh, I, I did say I'm a standards person, right? So, <laughs> um, so this uh, this standard is being used in in, in India. Uh, um, in, uh, in in Kenya, we're hearing, um, you know, in, in many countries uh, around the world beyond Europe. So, uh, you know, the, the impact here is, is is important. This harmonization, as as you were saying, Michael, um, you know, it's it's not feasible for us to go country by country. And I think one of the things that uh, the Web Accessibility Directive um, and 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 the, uh, the standardization work that had happened in that context led to a lot of harmonization. Uh, I recall when in Europe we had different versions of uh, web accessibility standards and, and kind of harmonizing that, but not only just internally in Europe, but looking across the pond uh, <laughs> to the US and, and uh, you know even broader internationally. Australia is maybe a country to, to mention that is also using, uh, I think there's a version of the EN301549 that is uh, Australian standard as well. 
Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, th this is uh, an, an important aspect for accessibility as well. Uh, having common standards accelerates the implementation of um, accessibility features and gets accessibility more quickly uh, to the people who need it. So, um, you know, it is from a business perspective uh, about uh, feasibility and, and, and being able to, to, to address things, uh, but it's also from the user side, which is really important to us, um, you know, a benefit to have here common standards. Okay, so we're coming to the end of this uh, wonderful session. Uh, Immaculata, from your side, any any f closing comments, any wish lists from Amazon, any uh, you want to how, how you want to anything that comes to your mind, and then shout it over to you. Then she has my email. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, we have been working together, Shadi, for many, many years in the W3C Way initiative, um, and uh, we will continue uh, to work in the standardization process. But my wish list is really that now we are entering the phase um, of implementation, and there we need to uh, work together to develop the standards. It's an invitation um, to participate in this process. It is really essential that all those affected by the standards, um, including, uh, of course, organizations of persons with disabilities, including industry, but also including public authorities, procurers, for example, participate in the process. It's really a call for participation. It's a call for um, collective uh, intelligence to be brought into this into this process because the repercussion, the impact that the, the, that the, the standards will have are uh, really very, very important. The other plea is about competencies, because we need to have people that have the skills, the capacity, the knowledge, the experience to implement accessibility. And there um, we really need um, to invest and to invest um, uh, in, in, in training, in education, and also provides all this process will provide. And this is where uh, I think my dream is uh, that um, it will result on more jobs also for persons with disabilities. Um, um, I think we need to, we can start talking about, let's hope about uh, the accessibility jobs in which, uh, you know, companies would be contracting people to implement accessibility. Um, we will need to have more uh, jobs in order to make sure that accessibility is there. Also the monitoring, the, 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 the uh, market surveillances. Uh, we need more competencies and uh, I hope this will bring really job opportunities also for persons with disabilities. Um, so this is a little bit where we are and where we hope to be there. And at the end, uh, the ultimate wish is that the products and the services serve the needs of uh, of the people. So um, and uh, including, of course, persons with disabilities. So let's hope that we see that happening. Uh, thank you so much, Ima. Thank you also, Shadi, uh, for this great uh, conversation. I think you really uh, achieved uh, to understand what this is about and uh, the change that will hopefully come for all of us in uh, starting in, in 2025. And now over to you, Petra, and uh, let's look how, how you saw this discussion and what your takeaways were. Yes, um, we started out with um, a quick explanation about uh, the European Disability Act that was uh, started in 2019. And it's all about uh, creating an act within the European Union uh, to make sure that products and services and all the information relating to products and services are accessible. Um, the next step is um, to bring that into national law. So by June this year, every European country should bring this act into their national law and then within the next uh, three years all the standards should be in place. We talked a lot about standards. Um, taking an example, a very important example, procurement meaning the government goes shopping and if they go shopping um, they have to make sure that they follow a list of obligatory features for accessibility. Um, and then we went over to Amazon and heard okay, how is Amazon actually doing this? And uh, we heard from Sadi that he said, well, rather than just following a checklist, Amazon always had and still has um, this idea and this hope that at the end, the ultimate goal is to have an accessible product and, and services. 
So they integrate the users into the development process. So from the idea to the product, the users are integrated. And that means also people uh, looking out for accessibility. Um, we heard what's in the pipeline from looking again at the European um, side. Um, the quality of the standards, the quality of the whole um, process is, in, is being looked at. And also new standards will be in place. I heard something about the um, emergency number. Not only the number has to be accessible, but the person has to be trained. And all these things have to go into the um, renewing of something that is already now in place. And I hope I didn't miss the most important things. Last um, that you said was maybe there will be more job opportunities for people with disabilities coming along with this standard. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Great as always, and this concludes uh, this uh, fireside chat. Thank you.